At the start of many technical revolutions, really uh, truly new technologies, like materials innovation, you know, the iPhones that you carry have display technology, they have battery technology that really was invented by somebody sitting around in a lab. Uh, you know, the high purity glasses carry information today over fiber optics for hundreds of miles without almost any losses. But there's enormous opportunity left, right? Uh, for example, I think of clean energy. If you think of solar today, which is about 20% efficient, we have debates about the economical merits of it. If you found the materials that doubled the efficiency of that at the same cost, we would simply not have that debate anymore. The whole the game would be over and we would have a transition. If you did the same for battery technology, right? If you get the higher energy density materials, um, you know, we would go to much higher market penetration of electric drive. And again, the, the debate would be over. So materials innovation really has that, uh, that, that opportunity to truly transform technology and therefore uh, society. But it's difficult, right? The average time to market is 18 years for materials. And I, I like to bring up Edison. Edison, when he looked for the light bulb filament, tried about 3,000 materials. He imported them from all over the world and tried them and then picked one. And the irony is really that he didn't find the best one. Within 20 years, his material was displaced by tungsten, which we then used for uh, almost 100 years. And there's a reason for that. If you, you think of materials, they're made out of chemical compounds, which is atoms coming together. They form some structure. There are hundreds of thousands of ways to do that. Uh, they all have unique properties, how hard they are, whether they're optically transparent, you know, whether they deform easily, whether you can make them into a photo absorber. Then we combine those elements through judicious processing into complex engineering materials. And again, there's an enormous amount of oppor opportunity there to diversify. And if I were to ask you how much of this we know, today we know less than 1% of known compounds in the world, we know less than 1% do we know their properties. So I compare this to you're driving around the continent, right, sort of like this. You have no map, no GPS, no Google Maps, no compass, and this is how you do materials design. And kind of what you want is this, right? You want Google Maps for materials. And what I'm going to tell you is how we will get to Google Maps and drive innovation that way, you know. Uh, Newton gave you F equals MA, uh, Einstein gave you E equals MC squared, right? Schrodinger gave you the Schrodinger equation, which is the basic equation that, that tells us how matter behaves. And today that is being solved with computers. It's being solved as a, in a standard way with computers. Uh, it's being solved on large computers. And the nice thing about computing is that you can automate it. So today one can scan through thousands of compounds and try to get their properties and rather than take this Edisonian way of like try one thing after another, uh, design things uh, within a computer, and therefore by the time you go in the lab and you're ready to spend a few years on something, you know that the outcome will very likely be good. Right? So here's an example, right? Today we have three commercial battery compounds in the lithium-ion battery industry. We tried about 100 in the lab, out of came three commercial ones. Now with a computer you can screen several thousands of them on at least sort of their initial you know, plausibility, are these going to be possible? And then you can decide how, what you're gonna chase after in the lab, right? Uh, here's something that, 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 that tells us how easily chemical elements substitute for each other. Again, something that in the past you would just only do by trial and error, but now that computers basically tell you if you take this element and that element, you're going to get somewhat similar properties. So uh, especially in today's resource constrained world, uh, an important property for materials. I want to give you one example. Here's a material that was purely designed by a computer. It's a material that's not known in nature. It was not known. It's actually a chemistry that's not known in nature. Lithium containing carbonophosphates. There is nothing in nature. Uh, it was designed by a computer. It's actually made in the lab. You can make it in beautiful colors and actually functions uh, as a battery material. Uh, there was some human involvement, largely computer design. So where can we take this, right? Um, I think we can actually discover what I would call the materials genome. We can actually find all the properties of all known and many unknown compounds uh, by using some of the computing power in the world. You know, the top 50 computers today in the world combine about one exaflop of computing. Uh, with actually a, a small fraction of that, you could actually expose the materials genome, find all these basic properties of materials, and then hand that over to the people who do materials design and materials engineering. There's a public project like that that has just started, which is called the Materials Project, which is a website that actually collects a lot of materials information, generates a lot of material information, and actually disseminates it throughout the world. So this is the first time we're actually taking all materials information and making it available to people. 
to hopefully design the kind of new materials that we need, whether it's for a clean energy revolution or just for uh, a better society in general. So thank you.